Well, welcome again. Um, it's great to see you. Um, we are in the middle of a vision series, and um, we're on week three, so the last week of the vision series. And um, we've been looking at the church in Ephesus and seeing what can we learn from this church. Um, this church was planted by Paul in about AD 52, somewhere around there, and he spent three years in this church. And the interesting thing is, you know, we've, we see a lot of our own vision in the vision of this church. It's a church that um, uh, was focused on making disciples. So Paul, one of his strategies was to, um, to disciple people who would make disciples. And in doing that, he multiplied uh, discipleship across the city and across the region. Um, the impact of uh, that evangelism and that discipleship was that um, the community began to be transformed. There's the story in um, Acts chapter 19 of these magicians who had become Christians and they publicly burnt all their scrolls, about five million pounds worth of scrolls in public, burnt, uh, just showing that their lives had been transformed. And the impact of what God had done in their lives was beginning to have ripples, uh, 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 ripple effects across the city. But one of the interesting things that Luke, who wrote the book of Acts, says is that um, all Asia heard the gospel. Paul never left Ephesus, but all Asia heard the gospel during that time. And how he did that was that he trained church planters to plant churches. And a lot of the letters um, to the churches in the first couple of, uh, first two, uh, two, three chapters of Revelation are to some of these churches that were planted by Paul, even though Paul didn't actually physically go there, he didn't leave the city, but sent church planters out from there. So we find our own vision mapped onto what Paul was doing, vi making disciples, transforming communities, and planting churches. That's why we've kind of used it as a, um, as a grid to unpack what God might say to us through this. Last week, Rod looked at um, the, the letter to the Ephesians, which was written maybe 10 years after the church was planted. And this is a letter that um, Rod focused on the body of Christ, that every part of, every one of us is part of the body, and we're encouraged to grow up, not just to stay like infants, but actually to grow up and play our part in the body. And um, we need each other. You know, we, you can't do Christianity alone. We're called to, to do our faith with one another as we worship and come to know and experience and pass on the love of God. And so this week, we are tracking on in history to um, a letter that was written by Jesus, kind of dictated by Jesus, to John, writing to this same church in Ephesus. You can see from the timeline here, let's go back, just that um, uh, John, the apostle, who um, probably wrote Revelation, same person, um, spent some time leading the church in Ephesus. He was probably with Mary, the mother of Jesus. He was asked by Jesus on the cross to look after Mary. And uh, history says that he was with her in, in the church of Ephesus during this time. And um, he was known to have this sermon. It was a short sermon, which went like this. Love one another. That was it. That was the sermon. And he, after a while, after a, a couple of years of that sermon... Um, people were very kind and loving and stuff, but they said, John, can we have a longer sermon and about a different subject? And apparently he said, uh, when you've got that right, then we'll move on to other things. <laughs> and so um, he was uh, very much focused on that, and you see that coming through his letters, uh, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, and uh, obviously the gospel that he wrote. But um, he was then, uh, during the um, emperor Domitian, there's lots of persecution of Christians, and he was exiled to the island of Patmos off the coast of Turkey. And he probably wrote the book of Revelation in exile. So he left maybe around AD 90. This is about six or seven years later. About the same length of time that this new congregation was planted um, in 2005. And something has happened to the church just in that short amount of time. Jesus says to them, You've lost your first love. You've lost love. Look at verse four. I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. He says, there are three great things about your church. Look at um, verse two. I know your deeds, your hard work and your perseverance. I know you cannot tolerate wicked people. 
I know your deeds. So you're great at deeds. You're great at doing good things. You're fantastic at that. You know, people know that you're a, you, know, you're, you, you do kind things to people. You've got these ministries that bless other people um, in the church and outside the church. You're great at those things. Fantastic. I think that's really good. He goes on to say, you're great at doctrine. I know you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. This is something that was a problem. You, um, we hear about the Nicolaitans. Just look at the church in Pergamum, just across the page. Um, chapter 2, verse um, 15. You also uh, uh, have those who hold to the teachings of the Nicolaitans. And what was that? Well, that's probably the verse before. Something to do with encouraging people to eat food that's sacrificed to idols and committing sexual immorality. So there's something about leading people astray. This group of people, through false teaching, led people astray. And he says, you are great at doctrine. You understand this Christian faith. You understand um, uh, that we need to put our faith and trust in Jesus alone. And that everything flows out of that. It starts with um, God's love and flows um, out to other things and we mustn't trust anything else that needs, needs, needs to be the first thing he says you understand that you, you understand the teachings you exclude those who are teaching anything false that's a fantastic thing and it says you're great at perseverance you've, verse 3 you've persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary so um, I should think that in a city where um, as the Christians began to grow in influence and we know from Acts um, chapter 20 that there were some problems that were stirred up because a lot of the businessmen were losing their business because of the Christian um, encouragements to follow Jesus instead. But people would have been started to persecute those Christians. We know in our own society that Christians are often discriminated against. We feel that in the workplace, in the community, where people um, sometimes are you know, speaking down at Christians and kind of... Uh, making fun of Christians and sometimes that affects the way we behave in our workplaces because we are fearful of what other people think. At the very best we want to do, choose our moments to, you know, to sow the right word um, at the right time. But there's that atmosphere isn't there a lot in our culture. Discrimination. Perhaps that's what they experience and Jesus says you've done well, you've persevered through these things. You've endured hardships my name. I think that's really good. But he says these things are fantastic, your good deeds, your good doctrine, your good perseverance. But actually, it's all going to fall apart because you don't have good devotion to me. You've got lousy devotion. You've lost your first love. I hold this against you, verse 4. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Their first love, their love for God. What had happened to this church? You know, we're called to love God with our whole heart, mind, soul, and strength. Because we're made to be in relationship with God. When we do that, everything begins to work. To love him with our whole hearts. And Paul had taught the Ephesians that. Just um, hold a finger in Revelation 2 and turn back to Ephesians. It's on page 1109. 1109. So, 20 years roughly before Paul had written this letter, and he'd reminded them of what he taught them right from the beginning about the love of God. Um, he, he reminds them, and he's praying for them. Verse 14 of chapter 3 in Ephesians For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray, verse 16, that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. So he prays for the power of the spirit to be at work in, in their hearts so they'd be strong in, in, in their faith in Jesus, that Christ might dwell in their hearts, that he might be the first um, in, in their hearts. And he goes on, and I pray, verse 17, part two, that you being rooted and established in love may have power, that same power, together with all the Lord's people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. So more than knowledge, it's a knowing, like you know a person, you know this love, it's an experience of this love that he's praying for, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. So these two things, praying that we might have the power to, um, to know the power of 
Jesus' strength, the Spirit's strength in our lives that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith and praying for the power that we might grasp his love so that this love might um, be uh, growing and growing and that we might know it, that surpasses knowledge, might know it in our experience, this love. And what's the effect of those things that we might be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. So Paul was teaching them before, love is where it all starts and this is what needs to be the center of everything that's like your engine that, um, that everything else flows from. And this is what Jesus says to them. He says, you have lost what you learnt at first. You've lost this love. You've lost it. Do you know, it is so easy to get caught up in doing great things that are going to help lots and lots of people in the name of Jesus and detach yourself from Jesus. There are lots of Christian charities that were set up in the 19th century and they, don't, they through political correctness and through um, moving away from their Christian roots, they've lost that connection. And they're getting into trouble. They're finding that the church is, is put in a difficult place in supporting some of the decisions that some of those charities make. They've lost their first love. Equally, there are people who are, um, they concentrate so much on doctrine that they lose love. For Jesus, I mean, there are so many people who go to theological college who come out worse than they went in because they've lost their first love. They, they know a lot more theology, but they don't know Jesus anymore. I'm glad to say that the people who have been to theological college here, they haven't had that experience. They've nurtured that relationship with Jesus, and that makes all the difference. It's so easy to happen. It's so easy for people you know, who are going for it. Um, uh, they're persevering and making you know, Jesus, you know, they say, I want to be a Christian, I'm going to go for it. And in spite of all the pressure and, and things from around, they lose sight of who they're actually going for. They have their eyes set on an image of Christianity rather than the person of Jesus. And Jesus says that if you keep going in this direction, you will be destroyed. Verse 5, consider how far you've fallen. Repent and do, things, do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. Lampstand here is a picture of, of the, the, the church, the spirit in the church. And it, I don't think he's saying, I'm going to destroy your church if you don't have Jesus, my, me at the center of it, my love flowing in your midst. But I think he's saying, actually, you're going to destroy yourself. And so you'll no longer be a church. And haven't we seen that so many times in churches where there's division, there's split, there's infighting, there's rebellion, there's kind of immorality, and churches fall apart because Jesus, as their first love, has been lost. This is the challenge. Jesus says you'll destroy yourself if you don't get your priorities right. That's why we must encourage worship and devotion to God as a church. You know, um, it's interesting to me, I was just thinking, reflecting as we were worshiping this morning, gosh, it's, you know, there is, Lord, you are wanting to say something about engaging with the love of God today. That was coming through again and again, wasn't it, in the, in the prayers, in the worship, um, the encouragements from that. I hadn't actually told um, Rod or Andrew that we were going to be focusing, you know, in our gift day on the love of God. And so God is saying something to us afresh. This is what it's about. We need to focus in our worship, in our devotional lives, on connecting with the love of God first, focusing on him. And it's out of his love for us, as we experience that, as we know this, knowledge, this love that surpasses knowledge, as we experience that, that begins to flow out in terms of how we behave, how we interact with one another as as believers, as, as we begin to interact with our world, as we begin to interact with our city, the love of God flowing out of that place. That's a, a huge value for us as a church, to, um, to bow the knee, to, um, to worship him, to make him first. And we do that in our connect groups, in, you know, in our PCC meetings, our governance meetings, we begin with prayer. Love lost. So, just picking up the theme of film tracks, what is love actually? 
grown. What is love actually? How can we recover our first love? How do we recover this? How do we respond to the challenge? Not just, um, you know, this is not just written to the Ephesians. This is written to all Christians. The first thing we do is do what Jesus encourages the Ephesians. Consider verse five, how far you've fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. Repent. Diagnose where you're at with God. I find I've, you know, I've done this many, many times in my Christian life where I've, I've lost track. I've gone, gone either off the boil or I've missed my focus. I need to come back to that place and say, Lord, I'm really sorry. And I need to, need to do a diagnosis. I need to say, where have, what's gone wrong? Why have I missed something? Where have I missed something? And we need to cultivate in us that desire for God again. It starts with saying sorry. And repentance is a 180 degree turn and going in the opposite direction. So it's moving away from a life that's not focused on God to a life that is focused on God. That we put him first in our work, in our community, in our relationships, in, in, um, our, in our vision for our lives. That God comes first. And our devotion for him comes first. The love that flows out of his love for us begins to flow into everything that we're doing. So some of the questions you might ask is, you know, how is my worship? It's very easy, I find, to just get distracted. And I know when I'm not kind of giving my all in worship. When I know most obviously in, in church when I'm with other people. I can ask the same of my private devotional life. How's my worship? How's my prayer? How's, um, how is my relationship with God? A slightly different question might be, what is the fruit of the Spirit that's growing in my life? Where is the love, the joy, the peace, the patience, the kindness, the goodness, the um, kindness, the self-control? Where are these things growing or not growing in my life? How can I cultivate those fruits? What needs special pruning to get more fruit in that place? And this question, what is God saying to you? What is God saying to you at the moment? God wants to speak corporately, but he wants to speak individually into your life. What's he saying to you? It's a question you can ask. Lord, what are you saying to me at the moment? What's the big picture? What's the specific things? And as he begins to put his finger on things, we can begin to say, Lord, I'm sorry and I want to change. I want you to change me. I need, that change begins with the love of God. I want to experience your love. I want your love to change me. I need your forgiveness. How is that appropriated? It's because he loves us that he died for us. It's through Jesus' death on the cross that we can be forgiven. And God always, with open arms, beckons to us and says, come. Come back. Come to my love, he says. And when we do that, I think we do what uh, Paul was teaching in Ephesians. We pray for um, the power to strengthen our faith, that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith. We pray for the power to grasp the love of God. When we've grasped that love, it begins to change us. And it begins to, uh, like uh, something, you know, water being poured into a jug and letting it overflow. It overflows um, and uh, uh, hopefully not ruins everything, but actually it floods everything else. It has an impact on everything else around it. So here are five things I've been thinking about in terms of cultivating um, a life of God, which I think all of us uh, is really helpful to be focusing on. One is how's my devotional life, my private life with God. You know, I want to encourage us to do a daily thing. That's what Jesus encourages, pray daily. If you don't do that, just try for five minutes and let that grow. Secondly, fellowship. Actually, we, our lives are not supposed to be private all the time. Our Christianity is not supposed to be private. We're supposed to do it in relationship with others. That's how we grow. And again, we want to encourage people to be in connect groups or small groups. If you're not in one, there's a blue card you can say, tick there and say, I want to be in a connect group. And we can link you up with one which is just right for you. Thirdly, we want to um, encourage people to join a team. Serving with others is such fun. It's encouraging when, you know, when you're sometimes being on a team is, is people are holding on 
to their face just by you know, their fingernails. And it's being in a team that holds them in. People can begin to start saying, are you okay? People wouldn't know unless you're in a team. But actually it makes such a difference to the life of the church when people serve in teams. And it cultivates this spiritual life because we're doing it not because we have to or should do, but because it flows out of a love for God. Giving financially, more about that in a minute. And this whole concept of discipling someone else. Who am I discipling? God, who would you like me to meet up with to encourage? It might be just a simple cup of coffee saying, are you okay? How's your faith? What's going on? It might be asking some of those questions. Meet up with someone and just encourage them. That's the beginning of discipling others. If we're all discipling each other, man, we're going to have a lot of really good discipleship going on in the church. And one of the questions might be, how's your love for God? When we come back to our first love, everything changes. The church thrives. Discipleship making begins to blossom and grow. Our communities begin to start being transformed because it's being done from the right motive. And churches get planted because the word, you can't contain it. It just starts um, flowing out. So, third thing, I want to focus on giving. Our vision as a church is to help cultivate these things. We want these things to grow in the life of our church. And the Ephesian church had lost its way. They were so sound that they couldn't hear Jesus. They were so, um, you know, going for, uh, you know, trying to kind of do good things that they'd actually missed on the very person who enabled good things to happen in them, Jesus. And to enable our vision to happen, we need to finance that vision. This heading is, you can't buy me love. You cannot buy love. Some people um, give money to church. Um, This is a kind of historical problem through the centuries to buy love, to buy indulgence, to buy forgiveness. And you know, it doesn't work that way. You cannot buy love. It's supposed to be the other way around. That as we receive God's love, that love begins to flow out from us. And that love is expressed in generosity towards people, towards, I um, mean, service, in finances, in resources. And the extraordinary thing is, you know, I, I say this again and again, you are an incredibly generous congregation. You're, an, uh, you're a generous church. So far, we, um, in terms of planning and what we've received already, um, £414,000 have been raised in the church. It's fantastic this year. Um, Rod was saying that there's a gap of 90000 I, I have good news. It's been reduced. We've um, had about 30000 over the last few days. And so, um, fantastic when God kind of preempts what you're trying to do. So, we'd, we're trying to close that gap just to the end of the year. And um, the way we're trying to encourage people to um, get involved in giving is we've got about a third of the church, 100, something like that, just over 100 people are giving by standing order. And we'd love to encourage as many people as possible to give by standing order. That just helps at so many levels. Um, uh, I said in the notices, um, you know, it's simple because it it just, um, it's an easy way to give. Um, Once it's set up, it just happens. It's systematic, so it's a regular amount taken out of your account each month. It's specific, you get the chance to plan for it. And um, it's, you know, the encouragement from the scriptures is to look at what you receive and to take a proportion of it and let the first fruits be given back to God. The first thing. That's why, again, a standing order is so good because you can say a specific date. For us, it comes out the day after. Actually, we give it two days just in case of the weekend around. Um, two days after. Our, um, my stipend comes into our account. We then give, it's the first thing that, that um, gets removed from the account. It's smart because we get the tax back, 25%. And it's scriptural. The, 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 the scriptures encourage giving regularly and giving generously. So that's why we encourage it. And it's great for the church. It helps us to plan. And we'd love to kind of increase that number of people who are giving by standing order. If you've never done it before, you start today, just a practical thing, just in your, in your um, seats, 
a little thing like that. Just reach forward. Just, just, just show me you've got one of those. Have a look. Reach forward. It's a participative service. <laughs> so that is, um, that's a kind of standing order form. You've held it in your hand. You know what it is now. And if you'd like to give by standing order, um, and you don't already, please do um, fill in one of those. There's also a card, a green card. Um, almost all the seats have got one of those. And um, that is a card where you can tick, actually, if you um, either, you might like to adjust your standing order, you might like to actually today give a one-off gift towards um, what's going on. And some people prefer to give just one-off gifts. And if you do that, please do um, tick the box so that we can help you get the tax back. Again, we can get 25% back on a, on a gift like that. It makes all the difference. Now, there are some people who um, are not in a position to give. And I want to just make sure that um, here's that green card. Thank you, Stuart. So lots of options there. And um, just we'll take some time just to review that at the end of the service. There are some people who are not in a position to give. And I want to make uh, absolutely clear that um, if you are in debt and you're struggling with that and it's kind of out of control, then please do not give. Are you hearing that? Please do not give if you're in that position. We would much rather, we do have a, um, a ministry of the church, which is money advice. And I would love to, if you are struggling or you're kind of not sure about whether your money's kind of going and it's out of control, please, please, please connect with Money Advice. The email address is on the screen, it will be in a minute, which is finance at stpaulshadwell.org. And um, you'll be able to have a confidential conversation with um, one of the team, and it just makes all the difference. You know, many, many people struggle alone with debt or with financial difficulties and it, it, it feels like it's a big deal to share it with other people and it is a big deal in some ways but it doesn't need to be and we want to just help people in the congregation and actually further afield because it's a community thing as well just to help their, get their finances right and it's everything from planning even if things are okay through to actually if you're in trouble and we need to help negotiate with, um, uh, with the people who uh, you owe money to there's going to be a course as well in January, a one evening course followed by individual um, appointments. So if you'd like to kind of connect with that as well, that would be fantastic. Just some specifics on the finances. Can we look at the, um, the charts? Um, income in the church, um, you'll see uh, this, this is where we get our um, income from and we need about 18%. Actually, that's reduced to about 12% now um, just for the rest of the year. So that's just some for information. And I'm just looking at the next one. This is what it goes towards in terms of we kind of worked out it's quite a good split, actually, uh, uh, between uh, uh, the three areas in our vision. This is really what the money goes towards. And if you want specifics on um, individual items, then please do connect with Jackie Driver, our treasurer. And just, um, just a site of standing orders. This is what we've got at the moment. And there's a whole range of um, standing orders, anything from, I think there's one for £2 a, um, a month, um, going right up to more than £500. And, you know... We'd love to encourage you just to start if you don't at the moment, and it makes um, a huge difference. Um, uh, you might think, okay, I'd, you know, I'd like to choose one of those. And um, when you're working out how much to give, you don't give already, look at the whole and say, Lord, how, what proportion would you like me to, to give to the church? If you want to check out some scriptures on that, 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 are really, really helpful. Very practical advice from Paul on how to give. So, we'll have an opportunity at the end of the service to have a gift um, opportunity where we get the chance to respond to God. And some will just be saying, yes, I want to continue my current standing order. That's wonderful. Some will want to be saying, I want to start one. Some will want to say, I want to give a one-off gift for the work of the church. Others will want to say, actually, do you know, I want that advice. And that's fine. We can do, we'll, all of that's confidential. And we'll have the chance just to, to do that at the end of the service. So, just coming into that, what did happen to this church well did the church listen to jesus did they seek out their first love well the good news is they did within 20 years of this letter being written there is evidence in early church history of um, the church being completely transformed it's like after the letter um, p.s i love you they got there in the end. Here's um, just an excerpt from a letter from Ignatius, who became Saint Ignatius. He was a bishop in the church, and um, he wrote an epistle to the Ephesians in about AD 110, somewhere around there. And he says this. 
I gave a godly welcome to your church, which has so endeared itself to us by reason of your upright nature, marked as it is by faith in Jesus Christ, our Savior, and by the love of him. You are imitators of God. And it was God's blood that stirred you up once more to do the sort of thing you do naturally and have now done to perfection. He goes on to say this, In God's name, therefore, I received your large congregation in the person of Anesimus, your bishop in the world, a man whose love is beyond words. My prayer is that you should love him in the spirit of Jesus Christ and all be like him. Blessed is he who let you have such a bishop. You deserved it. Here's a church that has recovered its first love. They've responded to this challenge in Jesus and they have found that first love. It's been noticed by a visiting bishop. And this church had responded probably under the leadership of a bishop who had run away as a slave. The story of Venismus um, comes out in Acts and also in the book to Philemon, the letter to Philemon, who was Anesimus' master. Anesimus was a runaway slave who um, was led to Christ by Paul, probably on his fourth journey in, in a Roman cell. And he, Paul encouraged him to go back to his master, who he knew already he was a Christian. And um, they obviously reconciled their relationship. And Anesimus went on to experience freedom uh, from slavery, but also to go on to be a leader in the church. And here's a, a man who has known what it is like to be free, to be set free. Someone who has experienced the love and the power of Jesus Christ in his own life. Uh, of how that as he began to lead, it began to have an effect and impact on his, his whole church. And we see the response of this church. They are known now, 20 years later, for their love. They've recovered their first love. They've, it's no longer lost. They've actually worked out what is the core of what we're about. It's about loving Jesus. That everything else flows from that. And I think that's something for us. For St. Paul Shadwell, we need to come back to Jesus. Jesus must be the center of everything we're about. As a church, as, uh, as individuals within the church, in a way that seems obvious, but actually in practice, we need to put him first in the little things and the big things in our lives. When we apply that to money, it's, I, I, you know, I hesitate to make the links because I don't want to kind of use it to, uh, in the wrong kind of way. But money is a natural outworking of, or giving is a natural outworking of love. And I don't want to force you, I'm not going to force you to give anything at all. But this is between you and God. We focus this time, if you don't want to do it now, that's totally fine. You might like to go away and think about it and to, um, to you know, address it in your own you know, looking at your finances, saying, Lord, what, what, what is the appropriate thing to do? But if you want to give here and now, we'd love to give that opportunity. And we do that, we have, um, we do that in worship and praise. There's a, um, one of the words that Paul uses, one of my favorite verses, that he talks about giving generously. And that word generously is, or no, um, cheerfully. That word cheerfully is from a Greek word, hilarion, which means hilarious. So we give hilariously here. And that's what we're about. We want to give in that spirit. If you're not in that place, I'd rather you didn't give. And just go away and get into that place of hilarity and then give. And work out what you're going to give. That's, that's the way we'd love to encourage at St. Paul's. But um, let's stand, shall we? I'd love to pray.